My name is Bernadette Clavier. I'm the executive director of the Center for Social Innovation at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. For today's Teach Aid COVID DB speaker series, I'm delighted to welcome Schumann Gosmat Jander. Schumann is, um, was for a number of years the click fraud czar at Google. Today, he's the global head of AI at F5 Networks. We're here to discuss the role of technology in times of COVID. In particular, we'll take a deep dive into contact tracing. We'll talk about its potential impacts, but also about its possible unintended consequences. So Schumann, um, before we, we take that deep dive into contact tracing, uh, can you give us a bit of a big picture view? What are the various strategies available to humanity to address a pandemic? And at what stages of the pandemic are those most relevant and effective and why? It's a great question. I think that there's a lot of information out there right now about how technology is being used in the context of the pandemic. And technology plays different roles at different stages of COVID-19 spreading. So for example, when we're talking about contact tracing, really what we're talking about is identifying where people have been who are uh, determined to be COVID-19 positive and who else they might have had contact with. And those determinations are a lot more critical in the early stages of the pandemic in order to be able to stop the disease from spreading. Once it's already uh, been uh, propagated throughout an entire population, it's not really that feasible to be able to contain it using mechanisms like contact tracing. So the very best time to have contact tracing technology would have been several months ago, but the next best time to have it is before the next surge or spike in uh, COVID-19 cases, especially in any given region. And so I think that uh, a lot of the development which has occurred over the course of the last couple of months is going to be particularly helpful if it can address some of the problems that are associated with it in uh, the coming months. Great. And so if I wanted to take part into contact tracing and get some alerts on my phone when, when I've been exposed to the virus, how would I do this? So there are a bunch of different options. And uh, you might be familiar with some of the apps that are out there uh, and some of the frameworks that are out there. Apple and Google have been working on a framework that they're going to be launching soon that will allow uh, apps to be built on top of a common foundation that will preserve privacy while being able to share certain details that will aid with contact tracing. But in fact, there are more than three dozen different uh, apps from various countries around the world that have been created and distributed uh, throughout uh, their populations in order to be able to help with contact tracing. Now, the way that these apps work varies significantly. So in some cases, we're talking about uh, a purely opt-in mechanism that's very privacy preserving that requires you to go through multiple steps before any personal data associated with your location would be shared with a third party like a government or a health agency. In other cases, that uh, sharing of data can be a lot more automated and uh, it uh, can happen implicitly. So for example, uh, in uh, some countries, the government has actually stepped in and used telecommunications uh, networks and uh, used the data that's already flow flowing through those systems in order to be able to perform contact tracing. And this is something that notably happened in Israel a couple of months ago, for example. But for privacy reasons, Israel's Supreme Court then stepped in and said that they're going to discontinue that program. Now, the benefits and the drawbacks of those programs um, make the issue more complicated because the benefits are pretty great from a public health perspective. So if you can actually get the information on the locations of everyone who is using a telecommunications network, now all of a sudden you've got the opportunity to be able to implement very effective contact tracing potentially um, by uh, being able to make uh, everyone who is in that population be part of the data that you're analyzing. But of course the drawback associated with that 
is you don't want to be tracking the location of every single one of your mobile phone users in a country uh, for any purpose because that opens the door to a variety of different undesirable uh, results. So uh, what privacy advocates are most concerned about is that once a government uses that type of data for contact tracing in the context of COVID-19, they might use it for a variety of other purposes to be able to predict uh, where crimes are occurring, to be able to uh, uh, track individuals that the government wants to track for a variety of reasons. And of course, this is why uh, privacy protecting technologies are being used in the context of contact tracing apps like what uh, Apple and uh, Google have created uh, so that the data for location sharing is very limited. So what, what they're doing in the case of many of these apps now is they're only using Bluetooth information as opposed to using GPS information. And there's a natural benefit to that technology because Bluetooth has a limited range. You can't use Bluetooth to be able to determine what your absolute position is from uh, a uh, geolocation perspective. So Bluetooth can't tell you that, uh, or and it can't tell any third party that you're located in this particular place in a city. That's what your GPS information can tell you. So what Apple and Google's framework does is it says using just Bluetooth related signals, I'm going to look for other folks who are also using this framework, who also have Bluetooth activated. And then if one person is identified as being COVID-19 positive, then you can identify the other devices that were in proximity of that device without knowing the locations of those devices. And that's the way that you're able to then assemble a set of devices or individuals that have come into contact with that person. And so all of the different privacy preserving uh, contact tracing mechanisms are based on similar ideas like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going back to my thought experiment. Let's say I'm participating in a, a program like this. Um, how if efficient would this be? Like, what are the chances of an information like this coming to me being real? Like, how seriously do I need to take it? What are the chances of false positives? That, that's a great question. And um, if you've got any data set where you have a number of individuals who have come uh, within proximity of one another, that's only giving you some... Uh, uh, directional guidance in terms of whether or not anyone else has been exposed to the virus itself. So you have to make a prediction. Uh, and on the basis of those guesses, of course, you're going to have both false positives and false negatives. You're, you're going to have uh, scenarios where uh, your data set is incomplete and there is transmission of the virus which is occurring, which isn't apparent just from the various Bluetooth connections uh, that, that you've had. Um, and that, that's going to result in uh, you not picking up certain cases of the virus being transmitted. But in, in other cases, it may appear as though there's been a great deal of contact between, say, two individuals, one of whom is COVID-19 positive, and yet there was no transmission there. So if you get an alert because of the fact that you've had a lot of contact with that individual, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're COVID-19 positive as well. And so the typical mechanism that's used in the case of contact tracing in general is to go and get a test as opposed to just concluding that someone is COVID-19 positive. But that's extremely uh, important in terms of being able to prioritize all of the different parts of a population that are going to get tested first. So if you're able to identify the areas of your country and the areas within a city that are at the highest risk associated with COVID-19 transmission, then you've got uh, the greatest opportunity to be able to contain the spread of the virus based on testing that you then roll out proactively. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's a lot of information that I'm giving up, Yeah, even, even if it is um, the, the Bluetooth version of um, the technology. Um, in giving up location information is something that we're doing in our day-to-day -day life within our family, for example. And so we've chosen to share our location so that we can know where, where other members of the family are. But that also means that when my son was 15 years old, he could get busted if he decided to go to the liquor store. So 
what could happen if I give up my data for contact tracing? Like who could see it? And what could they do with this? Um, what would they know about me? What are my risks? Well, well, you know, this is the, the fundamental question in terms of the mechanism that you use to be able to share that data for contact tracing purposes. So if you're using a mechanism like uh, the uh, Apple and Google framework, then it really limits the risk that's associated with nefarious use of that data. So uh, if we're talking about just Bluetooth to Bluetooth uh, communication, then it's not as though a cyber criminal or the government or anyone else uh, could go into that data set and determine all of the places that you've been. That can just be used to be able to determine who else you've had contact with. And you know it could conceivably be used uh, for other purposes. So for example, if, if you had uh, uh, a government agency that wanted to track um, where uh, people had been in contact with others who were on a particular watch list, then you know, that's something that could theoretically be enabled by using an app like that and sharing your data with an app like that. Um, but of course, it would require many people to use that app. And uh, you know, th that's something that is also a concern from a privacy perspective. If we have a lot of people sharing even a little bit more data than they ever shared before because of COVID-19 for some limited period of time, what could that data then be used for in the future? That's an unforeseen use right now. And how do we roll back any additional uh, private data collection, which is occurring right now in order to be able to curb the spread of the pandemic. So I think that the mechanisms that various contact tracing apps have put in place help limit the nefarious uses of that data, especially relative to just wholesale sharing your location information with a third party server or a centralized uh, government server. But you know, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of that data is already available in other forms if we're worried about cyber criminals, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're talking about how do I protect myself against a cyber criminal knowing my location or the government knowing my location, there are already mechanisms available for cyber criminals and the government to be able to track your location. So the telecommunications companies and Apple and Google have much more detailed information about where uh, you've been from a location perspective. In fact, you can go onto your phone and uh, if you're on uh, an iPhone, for example, you can go into the settings and you can see a list of all of the previous locations that this device has been. And that's kept private for you. It's not shared with anyone else, but the data is already assembled there. So if you click on a phishing link, for example, on your mobile device, and that's actually a cyber criminal who is trying to take over your phone, then they can get access to all of that data as well. Mm, that sounds so frightening. I, but it also sounds quite reassuring that there are ways that the companies running those um, you know, programs can protect our data. And maybe the risk is worth the benefit. Um, we're up against Quite, quite a challenge. So, and, and especially after spending so much time in our bedrooms, um, resuming a normal life feels like it might be worth the risk. Um, there are countries who have started using uh, contact tracing quite successfully, like in South Korea, for example. And, and yet here in the US, um, we're, we're yet to deploy a, a full program like this. What, why do you think that is? I think that there are significant differences from region to region when we're talking about attitudes towards privacy, as well as uh, uh, complexities associated with the technology infrastructure, the different devices that are used, uh, the different ways that um, uh, health uh, organizations are set up and uh, how they can get different apps adopted. And uh, the situation in the United States is actually similar to the situation in, in many countries around the world. Uh, the National Health Service in Britain, for example, uh, they're just getting a contact tracing app off the ground now. And I think that these apps um, need to be designed right from a privacy perspective in order to 
deal with some of the long-term privacy concerns that we talked about earlier. But uh, once they are set up uh, with those privacy concerns in mind, there's an additional challenge that's associated with actually creating uh, a uh, practical benefit, which is adoption. And this is uh, a big question mark in terms of how do you get uh, an app or a set of apps adopted at a high enough rate that it's really going to make a difference from a contact tracing perspective. So unless it's mandated by the government, which again has various downsides that make it undesirable, um, you uh, have to get people to voluntarily install an app on their phone that's going to share more private data than they've shared before. And so unless you get uh, in some estimates more than 80% of people to do that, you don't end up with a terribly effective contact tracing application. Mm -hmm. So beyond contact tracing, um, COVID has made it so that we're spending our entire day on a screen and online and um, things happen like Zoom bombing. Why, why is that? And what are new risks that we are taking by spending our entire days online? You know, I think that uh, this is something that we're all figuring out right now, and we're going to continue to figure it out over the course of the next several months, which is uh, how has COVID-19 and sheltering in place affected our society, especially from a technology perspective? Because technology has been our solution in terms of how does society keep functioning when we can't meet in person, when we can't go out of our houses and go to our offices the way that we used to. And so all of those in-person interactions have been replaced by technology-based uh, communications, and Zoom in particular has been uh, one of the most used video conferencing systems. And uh, you know, Zoom is currently worth more than Uber as a result of that. It's just unbelievable the adoption rates and uh, the usage rates that have resulted from sheltering in place. But this reliance on video conferencing and Zoom in particular has exposed gaps in the way that those technologies have been implemented that people just didn't think about several months earlier. So for example, uh, people just assumed in many cases that the communications that they were having through Zoom would be completely encrypted. And there was messaging on Zoom site that talked about how uh, those communications were encrypted, but it turns out they're not fully encrypted in terms of what we think of as end-to-end -end encryption. So if you've got the opportunity for a third party to be able to eavesdrop on those conversations, that's not a fully encrypted end-to-end -end, uh, connection. And so that's something that Zoom is rolling out now. It's, it's going to be an upcoming feature, but the way that they've proposed it, it's only going to be available to their paid users. It's not going to be available for all of the free Zoom users. And this is something that uh, uh, people are talking about in, in the privacy community right now. What are the implications that are associated with that? Because you compare it to other technologies like FaceTime, for example, on uh, Apple devices, and that is end-to-end -end encrypted. So that uh, gives you a level of protection from a security perspective that you don't have on systems that don't have end-to-end -end encryption. So I think that we'll see how this plays out over time, but Zoom has been very uh, quick to enlist the help of various uh, cybersecurity experts when these gaps were identified. And that's one of the reasons that they're working on adding these new features. So I, I'm sure that the way that uh, they'll roll out new features and implement these protections will continue to evolve in uh, the coming weeks and months. But you know, there are uh, a variety of uh, different concerns that uh, come about as a result of us spending so much time working from home and uh, using technology to be able to communicate with one another. So we're using our home PCs and uh, uh, devices more than we ever did before in a work context. And many of those devices don't have the same security protections that our uh, work computers and work devices do. And this is something that uh, is very different than uh, what we think of as the uh, bring your own device model that has been 
common in uh, corporate America for many years now, where people are bringing personal devices into their work environments. And now uh, security departments and IT departments have to think about how do they protect the work environment. There, they have the benefit of still being able to control what happens on the network that is provided by the office. In the current context, the network is actually provided by us. It's provided by the home users. And so when you've got personal devices connecting to home networks, now you've got multiple opportunities for security gaps. And this is something that cyber criminals can take advantage of. So if uh, you have uh, a security vulnerability in your home Wi-Fi network, or you have a security vulnerability in uh, your uh, mobile device or in uh, your personal computer or in another device that happens to be on the same home network that allows a cyber criminal to then infiltrate other devices. Now you've got a problem which is really difficult for uh, a company to be able to uh, deal with. And so many companies are uh, uh, just figuring out at this point what to do. And in some cases they're saying you can only uh, get your email by using a, a work laptop that has various security controls installed. In other cases, they're saying that uh, they need to install new technologies and products themselves to be able to monitor how uh, different corporate resources are used in order to be able to detect those types of uh, uh, vulnerabilities and uh, uh, any type of uh, cyber criminal activity. So I think that uh, uh, this is accelerating uh, a trend that has been in place for some time where we don't have the opportunity to be able to fully control uh, every device and uh, you know, every connection to our corporate resources. And so we, we need to think about this in a much more expansive way. And so monitoring that usage uh, is something that uh, I think uh, was already happening, but now it's going to become the standard way of uh, approaching security in general, because uh, you know everybody is working from environments that you absolutely cannot uh, control fully. Mm. Sounds like we had a few gaps, and they've they've been uh, enlarged uh, to the extreme and exposed. We we've exposed ourselves in the process of. of shifting quickly to new ways of working and um, ch changing our, our tools for more personal ones that are not necessarily as secure as, as you would want them to be. So there are a few, a few takeaways from our discussion that I'd like to sum up very, um, at this point. Contact tracing, sounds like could be implemented in controlled ways that would limit how bad actors might use our information against us. Um, it would still require an incredible amount of trust from um, public authorities or in public authorities to ensure that we can be confident that our safety uh, now and in the future is preserved. Um, but it's still the situation that has opened a lot of opportunities for cyber criminals, as we just discussed. So given all of this, um, what would be, as an expert in technology and online safety and security, um, what would be your advice for tech companies, but also companies using tech? Uh, as a focus in the, the next few months and also the next several years? I think that there are a variety of different things that uh, companies are going to be doing differently and already are starting to do differently as a result of sheltering in place and increased remote working in particular. So they're thinking about uh, how to protect their employees uh, against a wider array of uh, scams and uh, security threats than they were thinking about before. So now, uh, if you can get into somebody's home device through either phishing attacks or through uh, phone-based scams, uh, then that can threaten corporate resources. And so that's something that uh, they're trying to educate their workforces about. Uh, in fact, COVID-19 scams in particular are so great that uh, you know they've now become 
uh, the most common form of scam that we experience online. So you look at uh, phishing attacks and you look at uh, email spam in general, and the majority of email spam that's being sent right now is actually COVID-19 related. It's a variety of different scams ranging from fake miracle cures to donation scams to uh, uh, cyber criminals who are claiming to be able to uh, expedite stimulus checks. And all of these are used to prey on people's fears and uh, increase the likelihood that they're going to fall victim to that particular scam, which in many cases may take over their computer. Um, there are more than uh, 10,000 and by some estimates, maybe more than 100,000 uh, domain names that have been registered that are associated with COVID-19, many of which are fraudulent and uh, designed to be able to propagate these types of scams. So there's a great deal of activity which is occurring from the cyber criminal side of things. But uh, the other thing is that um, we are transforming into a society that is getting much better at using technology to be able to communicate with one another. So using video conferencing to be productive on a meeting is a skill set that uh, companies are developing that they didn't have uh, just six months ago. And uh, you look in a corporate environment, uh, you know, six to 12 months ago, and uh, you'd have various folks that might have been working remotely, but the vast majority of people in uh, most companies were going into the office or they were you know, doing something in a physical environment in order to be productive. And now so much of that has shifted into working remotely, but still needing to be productive. So now everybody knows how to use Zoom. Everybody knows how to use video conferencing and other remote working technologies, but not everyone is necessarily good at it. So companies are thinking about how do we pick the right technology? How do we educate our workforce on how to be able to use it most effectively? And how do we actually turn something that we've been forced to use into not only a competitive advantage, but something that's going to be an assumption in the future that uh, many people uh, in the coming months and years are going to end up preferring the option of working from home. And this is something that many HR groups are studying right now. How exactly is the corporate workforce going to be transformed and how are companies going to be transformed? And so if you've got that assumption as part of how your company operates, then of course, thinking about those remote, remote working technologies and thinking about how to be able to structure your business processes so they can actually uh, function extremely well using those technologies, that's going to be critically important. And so I think that we're going to see an acceleration of many trends, which were already underway prior to COVID-19 in the coming months. And uh, who knows, we'll, we'll probably see an acceleration of uh, VR-based technologies and AR-based technologies, because these allow us to be able to do more in a remote and virtualized capacity than we would be able to do otherwise. Truman, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your insights into the technology impact uh, uh, of COVID-19. Um, it's been really interesting to get a, a glimpse at maybe the dark side of human nature and what it's capable of, but also at the incredible potential of innovation in this, in this moment. So thank you so much for, for talking with us today. Um, I want to remind everybody that this interview was part of a series and, and for more interviews with global experts, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bernadette.